how can I be happy? Which I mentioned this to someone recently, and they said, well, doesn't that kind of uh, lead you to another question, which is, does God even want us to be happy? Is it right to want this? Um, this is something that people have been pursuing for a long time. People pursue happiness in different ways, right? And as I mentioned last week, it's even in our Declaration of Independence, you know, that one of our inalienable rights that is self-evident, in other words, it doesn't have to be proved, is to pursue happiness. And it looks like, it appears that different things make different people happy, right? So whatever makes you happy may not be what makes me happy. But the truth is much, much bigger than that. The Bible actually talks about happiness quite a bit. And if you think about verses like, rejoice in the Lord, right? We are told to be happy. Now, some people have defined joy and happiness differently. Uh, Christians have said, well, happiness is just kind of temporary based on your circumstances, but joy is something that is, you know, permanent. Really, they're all related. What the Bible cares about is what, where your happiness comes from. There is temporary happiness, right? Something that is temporary, let me ask you this question, is it from God? Is something that's temporary, is it from God? I think it depends on how we mean, right? If, if we rejoice and we are happy because we have a great vacation or because your child is smiling or because you admire nature and tomorrow you're not happy anymore because there are other things happening, does that mean that wasn't from God? No, I don't think so. I think God has given us all kinds of gifts. The question is, where does it lead you? Do you consider to pursue that object when you find happiness in your vacation or in your nature or your fishing trip or in your family? Do you consider to pursue that as the end all and be all? Or do you give God the credit? Do you thank him for giving you that gift? The Bible says that every good and perfect gift is from above. And so where does it turn your attention? And so I think the Bible actually talks about happiness quite a bit, and he wants us to find our happiness in him. He wants us to turn our attention to him. So the book of Habakkuk is really, really interesting because really it's a dialogue. It's a discussion. It is an opportunity for you to listen in on someone asking God that question. It is, it is an opportunity for you to hear someone complaining to God. Say, God, there's, I have some issues. I've got some problems with the things going on around me. And God gives him an answer. And so the book of Habakkuk is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is one of the things that Christians, I think, do, and I understand why we do this, and we're not all wrong, but one of the things that Christians do is they focus so much on heaven that they act as though the things going on on this earth don't matter. And that's not true either. You see, there's a balance, right? There, there are people who can be so concerned about things going on on earth that they're not focusing on heaven, which Jesus told us to do, store up your treasures in heaven, he said. But there are also people who think so much about heaven that they do, don't do anything for their neighbors. They do nothing around them, which is also a violation of Jesus, who said, you should love your neighbor as yourself. You should give someone else a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. The truth is that all of heaven and earth is God's. God has created all of it. Is he in charge of all of it? And so what matters here on this earth does matter. Sorry, what happens here on this earth does matter. And we see this from Habakkuk. The fact that this is in your Bible, and we see a person complaining to God about things that are going on, and God responds, you should notice that. You should notice that in one of the 66, book, 66 books in God's Word, there is a discussion here with someone asking God, why in the world is life like this? And what are you going to do about it? And we get to see God answer. So last week what we saw in the book of Habakkuk is we saw God, Habakkuk ask that question. How long, O Lord, the prophet cried out, shall I? I keep crying for help, and you will not hear. Or cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? 
He, now, part of the problem here is he's acting like he's the only one that cares. I look around and I see problems. I see injustice. How come you look at it and, and don't care? Now, his faulty assumption is he's assuming that because what he wants to be happening at that moment isn't happening, therefore God doesn't care. That's the faulty assumption he's making. And then he goes on to talk about it. Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. Now that anytime anybody ever says always or never, right, you know that's I'm that person, if you ever say always or never to me, I'm going to sit there thinking of one exception. You know, because if, if I can think of even, if you say always or never, and I can think of all, one exception, I just proved you wrong. Right. So, always, so never use always or never. No, no, not a good joke. Okay. But this is the kind of thing you do when you complain, right? You never, you know, fill in the blanks here. And so he says, and justice never goes forth. Well, that's not true, but that's what it feels like. That's what it seems like. That's what Habakkuk is expect- expressing. His major problem here, and, and the Israelites are, have been guilty of idolatry, but the, his major problem here is injustice. The courts are unfair. The wealthy, the influential, are bribing judges or just getting favors from judges uh, to get what they want. The, the wealthy and the influential are dragging the poor to court taking their land, they're applying laws unjustly. I mean, that's, that's the major problem here. Now, who he's talking to is primarily the nation of Judah because Israel at this point has been wiped out by Assyria, which is the first empire in human history. Now, what is an empire? I know if you see Star Wars, you think you know. But let me, let me explain what an empire is. An empire is a group of Nations or countries or peoples. There has to be more than one for it to be an empire. Okay? A group of of nations or countries or peoples who are ruled over by one ruler of one nation. In other words, it's one ruler ruling over not only his own nation, but a bunch of other ones that he's conquered. That's an empire. And so the reason in Star Wars it's an empire is because the emperor is ruling over all these different planets. Okay, the very first empire in human history is Assyria, and Assyria wipes out the northern kingdom. After Solomon had sinned, the kingdom had split to north and south. Israel were the ten tribes in the north, and Judah was Judah and little brother Benjamin in the south. And the ten tribes in the north get wiped out, and they get carried off into exile. And then Judah is committing the same sins that Israel was. And so several prophets go to Judah and they say, Judah, stop. Stop or or justice is coming. And it's not going to be so good for you. The same thing that happened to your neighbors, your brothers and sisters in the north, is going to happen to you. And so this is the time period in which Habakkuk is having this discussion for God, with God. And a major problem was injustice. So... The answer to the, the question that we asked last week was, you know, how can I be happy when God seems unfair? Now, I'm not going to give you the whole answer to the how can I be happy question today, because for that we have to go through the entire book of Habakkuk. Instead, what I'm going to show you today is the beginning of the answer. This is a journey. Right? This is going to take us a little while to get through because the problems in your life are real. They're not imaginary. Christianity is, is not a religion. It's not a belief system that pretends that suffering isn't real. And the answer that is given is not, well, just pretend it's not there or it's not real. It's not reality. That Christianity is not answer in that way. That would be insane. If you pretend or believe that the facts and the truth that you are experiencing is not in fact real, you have problems, right? You're, you, you're, if your brain is not acknowledging reality, that is a major problem. Christianity acknowledges that there are problems in the world, and they're real. There, there's some real suffering in your life, and there are real difficulties you deal with. Christianity doesn't say, well, pretend it's not real. Ignore it. 
That's not the answer that we get. The, the problems in the world, the problems in our country, the problems in countries around the world, it's real. And people are suffering, and they're suffering badly. And if, and if you don't know that, and I'm not saying that, please don't hear me as picking on you, but if, if you don't know about the vast amount of human suffering that's going on in the world, you're not really paying attention, because it's bad. And so this is a real question. How can I be happy when I know there's so much injustice in the world, when I know that people are starving to death who should not be starving to death because there's enough food? When I know that there are people who are in countries where their dictators are lying to them and they are, exp- and they are blaming someone else when in reality the problem is their own government. When there are people who are kept so much in ignorance and darkness they don't really know even how bad off they have it. When there are people dying of illnesses that they should not be dying from because there are treatments for that. How, how do we handle that? How do we handle corruption that happens in so many countries of people using their power just to benefit themselves? How can we be happy in light of that? And so today is the beginning of the answer to that question. So here's what God said to Habakkuk. We, began, we looked at verse 5 last week. Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. So here's what we find out from this. It's not as though God is saying, oh, thanks Habakkuk. Thank you so much for pointing out to me all the problems in the world. I had no idea. I need to do something about it. Here's what we find out. God is very aware. And not only is he very aware, but he cares. And not only is he very aware and he cares, but he's already doing something about it. Before Habakkuk even asked, God was already at work. For I am doing a work in your days. It's happening right now. Like You don't have to wait for it. Like I'm already at work. And it's not really what you expect. It's going to be astounding and amazing and incredible. Now here's the hard part. Amazing and astounding and incredible, right? which means hard to believe, does not necessarily mean good for you. Like, you may not like it. We use the word awesome, at least we did back in the 80s, right? Awesome. I love that we still use awesome. Totally rad, didn't survive. Right, tubular didn't survive. There's lots of words, but awesome still survives. But we did miss, in using the word awesome for everything, a little bit of the meaning, which means that it fills you with awe. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to like it. So God is at work. Let's look at see what he's going to do. Verse 6, he answers Habakkuk. And here's what he says in verse 6. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Now here's who the Chaldeans are. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians. And so the first major empire, the first empire in human history was the Assyrians. But there's this country called Babylon. Chaldeans is another name for them. And they're getting more and more powerful. Now, up to this point, they've been threatening a serious grip on power, right? They've been chipping away at the edges, and Assyria has been watching Babylon grow and grow in, port, in power and starting to conquer its neighbors. And God says, I'm raising them up. The reason that Babylon is getting more and more powerful and a serious grip on its empire is crumbling, and they're kind of afraid of the Babylonians, is because I'm doing it. Now, one of the things this tells us is that God is in charge, right? That, that, that God can do anything, and, God, and the people who don't even acknowledge him are still subject to his power. God is the Lord over all the nations, all of them, whether they acknowledge it or not. And so this is God's doing, and he is in charge, and something is happening. 
And then God describes the Babylonians that he is raising up, that they are becoming more powerful because of him. You know, are the Babylonians giving God the credit? No. Much like people in our world, in our time, have great power and don't necessarily and often don't give God the credit. Behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. So he's not describing good people here. And by the way, the Babylonians were not good people. They were ruthless. They were ruthless to their enemies. And they were terrifying. And so what God is describing people here are angry people who, who their army moves quickly, going through the breadth of the earth, all of the known land. They're going everywhere, and they're taking people's houses. They're taking people's countries. They're taking it. They're taking, they're taking, they're taking, and nobody can stop them. That's who I'm raising up. Wow. There's something interesting here. Because doesn't that sound a lot like a bully? Somebody who's just, hey, I want to play with that car. Hey, I want that piece of candy. That's my seat. And they just take it because they can, because they're more powerful? Boy, the bully feels strong. Because I can take what I want because I have the power. But there's something buried in here that maybe you might miss. There's not as much power there as maybe the Babylonians think, as much as the powerful think, who sees dwellings not their own. If you take something that doesn't belong to you, you can lose that same thing. It doesn't belong to you. Someone else more powerful can take it from you. Someone who gave it to you in the first place can take it from you. So, was it, have you ever asked the question, was it wrong for the Israelites to go into the land of Canaan and take that land from those people? No. Why? Because it was God's land in the first place. And God can give it to whoever he wants, which is part of what I was illustrating up here when I took the car from Wes. It didn't really belong to him. God can give it to anybody that he wants. So they seize dwellings not their own. Well, okay, guess what? God can take it back from them. But for now, because they're in charge, they think they're in charge. They think they're powerful. Now look at verse 7. They are dreaded and fearsome, and their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Now, they are terrifying. They have a powerful army. If you are in your little village and you're, out, and you're outside of town and you're out there, and you're out there t tilling or plowing or taking care of your crops and you look up and you see the Babylonian army, <gasps> they're terrifying. And their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. What's happening here? God is acknowledging, right? God is telling us that this is who these Babylonians are. It's their version of justice. It's what they think is just. A lot of times when people say, that's not fair, what they really mean is I'm not getting what I want. It doesn't fit my definition of fairness. So they have justice that comes from themselves. They define what's just. Now, where they're wrong is they really don't. God does, but they think they do. And so their justice and their dignity comes from themselves. They think that they're just fair and dignified because they're just fair and dignified. They self-define it. Now, how many people, I don't know the number, rhetorical question, how many people does this describe today? How many people think that they are just and fair and full of dignity just because they've defined it to match themselves? If I do it, Therefore, it's right, because I'm always right. They simply make themselves the standard, and it comes from their own judgment of themselves. How many people don't acknowledge where their strength actually comes from? 
I will tell you that over the last uh, 10 years or so, I have come to appreciate sports and athletics way more than I did when I was younger. I think part of why I didn't appreciate it when I was younger was because I couldn't do it. So I was just jealous, right? But now when I watch athletes, it, it fills me with awe. It, believe it or not, it causes me to worship. When I see some wide receiver jump 100 feet in the air and make this ridiculous catch with like a pinky, right, and come down, I'm like, praise the Lord. That's amazing because God made the, the human body to be able to do this astounding feat. I mean, I do. I praise the Lord for that. It's incredible. And I got to see it, right? I mean, I really enjoy seeing incredible feats of athleticism. It's incredible. But here's the sad part. Not all of those athletes know where their strength came from. A whole lot of them are really proud of themselves. I'm awesome. I'm great. Right, which I think is a requirement for a wide receiver, I'm told, is you have to think that about yourself. Right? But there are other athletes that recognize every single thing I do, even when I work hard. The ability and the desire to work hard comes from God because God owns everything. Because so how can you be happy when life seems unfair? The first step is to recognize that God owns everything. To, the first thing to do is to recognize that nothing you have comes from you. That God sets the standard of justice. You don't. And everything you have comes from God. So the first step of finding contentment and happiness in a world where it doesn't seem like there's any injustice is to recognize that God owns everything. And so rather than be jealous because somebody else has something that you don't recognize, that they don't really have it either. All of it's on loan from God. It all belongs to him. That's the first step. Now let's look and see what happens in verse 8 as God is still talking. Their horses, still, God is describing the Babylonians, are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. Their cavalry is terrifying. They are fast. They are powerful. They are strong. And they are coming. Let's look at verse 9. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. Now imagine this, right? They're not turning. They're not retreating from you. They're not a little bit sideways and guarded. They are coming in full confidence because they know they're stronger than you and you're going to lose. And they come for disruption. They, they gather their captives like sand. They, their, their captives are so numerous. It's like sand on the she seashore. They come and they kill or they capture it. <sighs> powerful. Now what they don't realize is that their power doesn't actually come from themselves. It comes from God. And even as they flout to God, even as they do what they want, it all comes from him. In fact, they're accomplishing his purpose. Because, well, I'll explain why in a minute. Let's look at verse 10. At kings they scoff, at rulers they laugh, they laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. So their cavalry comes, right, and they just, just conquers everything. Their infantry comes and looks at your puny city and goes, <laughs> those walls are so cute. Oh, that's adorable. Look at your little army. <laughs> and they build up dirt ramps and they overrun you too. Look at verse 11. Then they sweep by like the wind, and they go on. Guilty men, whose own might is their God. Now this is kind of strange. Okay, it's really strange. Because what Habakkuk has said is, Lord, how can I be happy? What can I do? When I look around, I see nothing but violence and injustice in my nation, in Judah. And God says, uh, look up. I'm going to deal with the violence and the injustice in Judah. I'm going to send you people who are worse. 
Because what they're going to do is they're going to bring violence to Judah. Those people who have been oppressing others and using their might and their strength to benefit themselves, they're about to get a dose of their own medicine times 10. And so, Habakkuk, you wanted justice? You wanted those people who are punishing, who are uh, oppressing others to, to stop? You want them to suffer, to experience what they've been doing to others? You want justice? It's coming. I'm sending them. There's going to be justice. The guilty in Judah, they're going to be punished. What's been happening in the courts, what's been happening with the wealthy and the powerful oppressing the weak, it's going to stop because I'm sending judgment. I'm sending people who are worse to bring judgment. And so these people who do not recognize God are going to be an instrument of God. Guilty men. God holds them guilty, whose own might is their God. And there it is. How many people today do, is, is described by this? How, how many people could we say whose own might is their God? I worship my own power. I worship my own strength. I worship what I am able to do. Now, here's the thing. God is sovereign in charge. And the people who have been doing wrong in Judah, they're going to be held accountable. It's coming. The Babylonians are going to be the instrument for a little while. Because eventually, because they're guilty, they will also be judged for their sin. And so, God's sovereignty does not eliminate human accountability they are still, though they are God's instruments here, they are still accountable for their sin. It's just that God's timing varies. He may not bring justice exactly when you want. I'll add that his timing is perfect. And so the reason for their guilt is that their strength is their God. And there's no repentance they don't feel sorry for what they're doing. And they will pay for that eventually. And so how can we be happy knowing there is injustice? Well, first, by recognizing that God owns everything. And second, by realizing that he will deal with it eventually. You cannot escape God's justice forever. Look at Habakkuk's response in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? Are you not from eternity? Have you not been around since before there was a forever? Have you not been involved in human history? We won't die. Now this is a great statement of faith. To know that even though judgment is coming, that as a people they will not completely cease. O oh Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. So he acknowledges that God is using, going to use the Babylonians as judgment on Judah. And you, O oh Rock, have established them for reproof. This is what you are doing. And he acknowledges that. He acknowledges that God is in charge. Now look at verse 13. You who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Wait, 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 Habakkuk, aren't you paying attention? You just said, God, why are all these things happening in Judah? And he just told you that he's doing something about it. And now you're saying that he doesn't care. He does care. That's why he's doing something about it. Habakkuk's complaint is basically this. God, how come there's so much injustice? Why won't you do anything? We cry out to you. God answers, I am doing something. I'm sending the Babylonian. Babylonians, and Habakkuk responds this way. Seriously? The Babylonians? The Babylonians? That's your answer? They're worse than we are. They're more wicked than we are. After you're done judging us with them, you're going to have to judge them with something even more powerful. 
Why are you allowing this? Look at verse 14. You, you are in charge, God. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. In other words, if you picture a fish in your boat or in your cooler, you throw them in there, no water, they're flopping around helpless, right? Insects walking around your house, what do you do? Take your foot because you step on it. You've made humans like this. We're, we are helpless before you. And then he describes the Babylonians. Look at what Habakkuk says in verse 15. He, talking about the Babylonians here, brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. In the wrong things, the Babylonian worships. The Babylonian rejoices, which is a term that's used, this Hebrew term is a term that's used when someone is responding to something that is value, valued and honored. They're worshiping their own nets, what they are able to do when they conquer others. Look at verse 16. Therefore, the Babylonian, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. And for by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. He worships his power and his strength and his ability to get stuff, and he's rich. Again, how many does this describe today? That worship their own things that they've accumulated. Then look at verse 17. He grows fat over all of this stuff. He grows rich over all of this stuff. He eats good food because of what he's taken from others. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net, right? He worships. Is he going to keep doing that forever? Is he then, Habakkuk says, to keep on emptying his net? To keep on just taking from people and mercilessly, without mercy, killing nations forever? Are you going to allow this forever, perpetually? This seems like a strange answer to our question. How can I be happy, God, when there's so much injustice? And here are the answers. Number one, to begin to be content, recognize that God owns everything. That's the first step. Recognize that everything you have, recognize that everything everybody else has is all God's. Maybe you've been, whatever you have, it's been given to you on a temporary loan. That's the first step. The second step is to recognize that God does actually care about justice. That's why he's sending the Babylonians. He's not going to let the people of Judah keep doing that forever. As we look around in our world, just because it's happening now, doesn't mean that God's going to allow that forever. Justice is coming for everybody. It may happen in different times and in different ways, but God does care about it. And he does care when, God, when people use their power and their strength to oppress those who have less. And finally... So what do we do? We recognize that God owns everything. Number two, we recognize that God does actually care about justice. And number three, we see that God's ways are better. Now we're going to build on this next week. But just because God's plan doesn't match yours doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan. In fact, if you acknowledge that God has existed forever... And that God is all-knowing and all-wise. Is his not plan therefore going to be better than yours? And just because you can't see it, just because it doesn't make sense to you, do you get to sit in judgment on God and say, Well, God, that's not how I would have done it. No, his plans are better. His picture is much bigger. He sees more than you see. When I've told my kids, and I can say this with confidence, many, many times, is I've said to them, I'm not smarter than you. I'm not. But, because I've lived longer and I've seen more, for right now at least, I'm wiser than you, and it would be wise for you to listen to my advice. Now, God is smarter than us. 
But what I want to point out to you is his picture, his experience is much bigger than yours. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. His vision is much broader. And so God's ways are better. And here's how we close today. Look at the last verse we're going to look at today. This is chapter 2, verse 1. This is how Habakkuk closes his second complaint. Remember what I said? Habakkuk says, why is there so much injustice? Right? Why don't you care? And then God answers, I do care. I'm raising up the Babylonians. And Habakkuk says, the Babylonians? Really? And he ends here in chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand in my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see, to see what he will say to me and what will I answer concerning my complaint. That's how he ends in chapter 2, verse 1. He ends with, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait and see what God is going to do. And so that's the final answer to our question today, is that he's waiting for God's answer. What's wise about this is that Habakkuk recognizes that his perspective needs to be shaped by God. And so he says, I will wait for your answer. And so the final answer to our beginning to be content in the face of injustice is to wait for God's answer. To take our questions about God to God. To pray and to wait for his answer. Our temptation is to find answers before we hear God's answers. And so we, wait for, we listen to human beings who tell us and explain the things that are going on or tell us how to be happy. And Habakkuk says, I will wait for your answer. Your perspective, my perspective, needs to be shaped by God. And so those are the answers. Number one, recognize that God owns everything. Number two, see that God does care about justice. Number three, see that God's ways are better than ours. And fourth, wait. Wait for God because your perspective needs to be shaped by his. Please join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know you care about wrong and injustice. Lord, when, you, when we are the, the cause of that wrong or injustice, Lord, help us to see it. Help us to repent. Lord, let us not be like the Babylonians. Lord, us to rec help us to recognize our own guilt to, and to use our power and our strength to help others and not to harm them. And Lord, we thank you for this lesson. Lord, my prayer is that we leave this place, that this would not just be a lesson about ancient peoples, but that you, through your Holy Spirit, you would allow us to see how this word communicates, that we would see examples of justice around us, that we would see opportunities for us to be your instruments. And Lord, prevent us from being like the Babylonians. Lord, help us to see that everything good we have comes from you. And Lord, we thank you for all of those good things you've given us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.